Hey guys, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is David Dorner, and I am the teaching pastor here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it is so good to be with you. Our mission in this world is to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus for a lifetime or if your journey's just begun, we hope that this message will speak powerfully to your heart, that it will reveal something that God desires to cultivate in your life, and that you'll be drawn to the person of Jesus as a result. We hope these next few moments encourage you, challenge you, and inspire you to be who God has created you to be. We hope you enjoy it. Good morning, Frontline. It's good to see all of you. It's good to worship with you, pray with you this morning. And uh, I'm just, I can't wait for what we're diving into today. Uh, Welcome, if you're watching online too, this is going to be a powerful next few moments together. Um, First service was just incredible. Uh, for what God is doing and cultivating already in our church around the theme of prayer. And so I'm so excited to just dive in. Uh, This is a series that um, we plan series as a teaching team together, all the Zero Collective churches and and their leadership, they come together and we we try to discern like, okay, God, where are you leading us? What are you doing? Um, What do we need to be obedient as far as like teaching goes? And this is one that started probably three or four months ago. God started cultivating something in all of us that was like prayer. I want to call you to prayer. And just as I've reflected, uh, I've been here at Frontline for about five and a half years, and some of the most significant moments, significant, the most significant pivots or changes or new directions that we've taken as a church have been preceded by prayer. I mean, I remember three years ago, if you were around three years ago, our roof was in dire need of some attention. We had a sound system that was falling apart every single week, and so we needed both of those. We needed them quick, and uh, I remember our, I think it was our leadership team that said, before we start doing a financial campaign or whatever, what does it look like for us to come to the table and pray? And so as we saw it, we felt like God was leading us into a time and into a season of 40 days of prayer, and it changed our church. And what's funny is as I look back on that, it's like the, the sound system and the roof were an asterisk compared to what God actually did and how he moved us as a church. And so I just thought about that in the last year uh, or in the last three years. Uh, in the last year, this has been interesting too. So something we pray for all the time is like baptisms. I mean, Nick just talked about it, baptisms coming up next week. Baptism is something that we always pray for in advance. We, we get ready. We pray that God cultivates and prepares hearts to respond and, and to, for baptism. Uh, even Saturday nights, uh, Brian and I come in here and we get to pray together. And so baptism eves are really important because we just pray for God to do work, to do ministry through his Holy Spirit that only he can do. So, I mean, this is wild. I want to share this with you. In the last year, we've already had 57 baptisms this year. That's 57 people that have given their lives to Jesus. And then a, a year ago, uh, around Christmas time, one of the things that we felt like God was leading us to again is this Jesus banner over here. We do a significant ask every Easter and every Christmas to those that are there because we know sometimes we get one shot as a church. People give us one shot. They come in once a year or twice a year. And so last year we said, what does it look like if we have people allow them or like we allow people to write their name up on this Jesus banner symbolically saying, you know, Jesus has written himself into my story. And the last time I counted, which was like two weeks ago, we had a 167 names written on that Jesus banner. Is that amazing or what? I mean, 167 people. And here, here's what I want to highlight again. That was preceded by prayer. Something that happened uh, last week, even, it was really, it was kind of wild. Carol Ann is one of the worship pastors that's here on our staff. And so she was up here, she was leading last week, she was standing right there, and she said this piece, I listened to both services, it just moved me, it was so powerful. She said, as I was praying the night before, so it was Saturday night, she said, I knew I had to say something, I knew God was asking me to speak here, but I didn't yet know what to say, and what I felt like God said to me is, why do you keep running to empty wells? Why do you keep running to empty wells? wells. And as she shared that, our teaching team, our jaws hit the floor. And so we went up afterwards and we we said, do you know like what the anchor passage is for the series that we're going into starting today? Do you, do you know what that passage is? And she goes, no, I don't know what that passage is. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. It's Jeremiah 2.13. It says this, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Is that incredible or what? 
This is such a significant season that we're stepping into together as a church because God is leading us, and it's to prayer. I think so often we treat prayer more of a, a transition. We, we, we treat prayer as like we, we use it to get something rather than, than just spend time in prayer. I want to I put this question up. As I was thinking, I'm like, what's, what's like the normal church question that revolves around prayer? Here, here's the question. What do you need prayer for? How many of you like in your small group or just here at church or like if you're in a class or something like that, if you're in anything that's like a Christian function, isn't it true that this is often the question that gets asked or posed to the group? Right? This isn't surprising. So what do we start thinking of? Oh, man, I, I could use prayer for, you know, my car broke down this week or one of my family members is sick. I could use prayer just for our marriage or relationship, whatever it is. We, we often put the emphasis here. We put the emphasis on the word for. And this is why this is so significant. When we put the emphasis on the word for, we are using prayer as a transition to something else. So prayer, as I come or as I ask or as I seek prayer for something, I'm using prayer as a means to do something that I want to do or to get something that I want to get. But but this series is not about that. This series is not about how do I use prayer to get what I want from God. This series is not like, how do, I, how do I engage in prayer so that God will move in my life or speak to me or bless me? It's not, it's not about what we get. In fact, the emphasis in this question, I think it's still a great question, is this, what do we need prayer for? Because if we're honest, so many, I mean, just in the church culture, we pray for things that often we try to answer ourselves, don't we? It's like if we say, man, I, I just need provision. I need God to provide a car. We're going to go out and we're going to go look for a car. Or if we say, God, I, I just need God to heal me. It's like we're on WebMD. We're trying to diagnose ourselves and then look for at-home remedies. It's like we're trying to answer our own prayers. God, I, just, I feel like I need a new job, so I'm going to go out and look for a new job. It's like things that, that we want or things that we desire, we often pray for it, not from a place of like, I'm just coming to spend time with the Lord in prayer. We, we approach them as like a drive through mentality. Like, I, I want to zip through the drive through I want to place my prayer order, and I expect it to be ready and handed to me within a couple minutes, and then I'm going to drive away, and I'll come back when I'm hungry again. Is that not the West Michigan church culture around prayer as well? I mean, I didn't grow up in West Michigan. You know, we referenced that a couple of times. Even, even this last uh, Thursday, we just did the Zero Collective Worship Night. We had all four churches in the Zero Collective here in Grand Rapids come together for the purposes of worship and prayer. And this is what's so funny to me about not growing up here in West Michigan. West Michigan, you can be starving. Or you could be so thirsty, your lips are dry and they're chapped and you got cotton mouth. You can be so thirsty or so hungry and then you get in a room like this and somebody puts a buffet in front of you and not one person in the room moves. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go first. I don't want to single myself out. I don't want people to know that I'm hungry. I don't want people to know that I'm thirsty. I'm talking like Thanksgiving. Like if we had a Thanksgiving celebration, I'd bet money that all of you would just sit right there and you'd see the whole buffet and nobody would move. But I think that's honestly how a lot of us approach prayer. God says, I have something for you. And I'm here to tell you today, God has something for you today. There's a buffet that he's going to put out, but the ownership is on you to actually come forward and eat of the buffet. That Jeremiah passage, you know, Jeremiah 21, 13, God says, you know, my people, this is what my people did. They've committed two sins. They've replaced me as the spring of living water. Check out this spring. This spring, this is an artesian spring in the Middle East. A spring comes from the ground. It's running water. It's living water. It's flowing water. It's been purified. It's clean. It's good. It's refreshing. The spring, what's so amazing is the spring brings water to you. Like you don't have to go out and find water on your own. It's like the spring brings it. It's this never-ending supply. God says, this is who I am. I'm a spring of living water. If you drink from me, you'll never run out. You'll never thirst again. I'm a spring of living water. My people have replaced me, the spring of living water, with this, with a cistern, with a jar. 
with a man-made solution. What happens when water stops running? The process of deterioration begins immediately. It starts breaking down. It starts acquiring or accruing bacteria. It starts getting moldy or algae. And, and what God is saying is, I, it's almost like he doesn't understand He's like looking at his people going, when you have access to the spring of living water, why would you ever come here for a drink? But if we're being honest, we do the exact same thing. Spiritually speaking, we run to things that serve us or serve our needs that we think we can do for ourselves rather than going back to the living spring that God has to offer for us. So God says, I I hold these two sins against my people, that they've forsaken me as the spring, as the well of living water. And they built their own cisterns that can't even hold water. Here's what he says a couple chapters later. In Jeremiah 7, verse 9, what God says is, Will you steal and murder? Commit adultery and perjury? Will you burn incense to Baal and follow other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, We are safe. Safe to do all of these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. This is an incriminating passage for us. Here's what God is saying to his people. You show up on a Sunday. You act like everything's all put together. You act like you're fine. You act like you're full. You act like you're attached to the spring, but you have built so many cisterns of your own. And they're moldy, full of algae. They're disgusting. They're actually making you sick. And yet you come in to God's place, his house of worship, his house of prayer. As we come in, we pretend like we're not doing any of those things. We pretend like we're not running to those things. We pretend like we're not drinking from them. And God says what? So, and so you're safe here? You're safe because you fooled everybody else around you? He says, I've been watching you. I've been watching. So here's Jeremiah's response Again, a couple chapters later, Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah says this, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. Why does he say that? Because we treat our lives like they're ours. We treat them like it's mine, it's my life, it's my decision, my country, my money, my family, my stuff. We, we treat our lives like they are ours. And Jeremiah is saying, no, 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 God, people do that, but, the, but our lives are yours. It is not for them to direct their steps. Discipline me, Lord. Discipline me, but only in due measure, not in your anger, or you will reduce me to nothing. You'll just crush me. But here's what he says right after. He says, pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you. Pour your wrath out on the people that ignore you, who are apathetic to you, who disregard you. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the peoples who do not call on your name. Genesis chapter four is the first like descriptor of God's people. And the description is, or the description is those who call upon the name of the Lord. That precedes Israel that precedes Abraham, that precedes... The the people of God were known by calling upon the Lord. So I'm just going to tell you, this is not going to be a comfortable series. Because what what I really feel and what I really believe today, there's an ask on the table for you. And the ask is going to be that you would respond. Like I'm going to ask you later in the service to come forward up here. Because so many of us are running to broken cisterns or empty wells or moldy, algae-filled, disgusting water that is polluting us on a soul level. And then we walk into here and we act like things are just fine. 
And God is saying, turn, stop, quit. Like, come before me. I'm the spring. I'm the well of living water. I can quench your thirst. The one that drinks of me will never thirst again. I'm going to invite you to come forward. But West Michigan, here's what I know. Most of us, what we're going to do, because it's safe, is we're going to sit like this. We're not going to move because we don't want to single ourselves out. We don't want people to think that we're thirsty. But there's an invitation today. There's an invitation for this series. We believe God is leading us to prayer. But here's the thing. We don't often use prayer as a destination. We use it as a transition. Which means prayer is not just a transition. It's a destination. Prayer is this thing that we run to and then sit. It is not something we run to to get where we want to go. I had so much content for this sermon. I, had so, I, I did not have a content shortage for this one. one I probably had four sermons in one. <laughs> I was so excited. And then the longer I sat, my excitement turned into guilt. Because how I've modeled personally, most of my prayers before you on this stage have been as a transition, not as a destination. And I want you to know I'm sorry for that. God uses prayer as a transition to move us into deeper relationship with him. But that happens when it's a destination for us. I'm going to think about even announcements or moving from one thing to another. It's like prayer should be part of those transitions. It's submission to the Holy Spirit saying, okay, Lord, lead us as you move us from place to place, thing to thing, song to song, whatever it is, move us. I'm not saying that's bad. What I'm repenting of is for demonstrating that that's mostly only the way to do it. Instead of just modeling, come and sit. What we're gonna do is pray. And that's our end. God has an invitation for all of us today. Every single one. But most of us don't treat prayer like it's this great invitation. Our prayers are shallow. Because we've actually elevated things above God. We've elevated country above God. We've elevated safety above God. We've elevated wealth above God. We've elevated image above God. We've elevated independence above God. We have elevated so many things above God. And what prayer does is it rightly orients our hearts and puts God back on the throne above everything. That's why prayer can't be a transition only, because if prayer is only a transition, it leads us to the things that we've elevate, elevated above him. But when it becomes the destination, all other things that we have desired or replaced God with get realigned. And all of a sudden, God is above, he's above all of them, and he rightly shapes all of them. So I, this is embarrassing. I got a couple embarrassing things to tell you today. Uh, about six months ago, uh, I reached out to a man. I just felt like God kept putting this man's name on my heart. I'd only met him once, and he'd prayed over me before, and his prayer changed my life. I mean, it changed my life. The, the way he prayed and what he prayed, he spoke things into my life that nobody could know except God. And I'd known him for 10 minutes before he did. And so I, I hadn't seen him for like six months, and so I start feeling like, God, why do you keep putting him on my heart? Why do you keep putting him on my heart? And so finally, I'm like, you know what, whatever. I'll just give him a call. So I call him up. His name's Ted. I got his number from somebody else. I didn't even have his number. Got his number, called him up, and he answered the phone. I mean, how many people answer their phone today from a number you don't? I was like, oh, no. I was planning on leaving a message. Now I have to talk. I, I don't know. Is this Ted? Yeah, I said, hello, this is Ted. Uh, my name's David. Do you remember me? He's like, you're going to have to be more specific. I said, I was the guy that X, Y, Z. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember you. And I said this, I, I'm a pastor in Grand Rapids. Can you teach me how to pray? That's a humbling thing to ask. 
particularly as a pastor, a non-pastor. But I mean, I, he prayed for me. The way he prayed was different than the way I pray. The power I experienced from him is so different than the power that I've drawn. I, I went, can you teach me? And he, and he says this, David, I've been praying for 60 days for the opportunity to teach someone to do just that. And then you called. I said, well, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Where do we start? What do we do? It's like I felt like a baby starting all over again. Because most of my life, prayer has been a transition. And that's it. What I was asking him is teach me to make prayer a destination. So many of us in this room, we, we might say this, I don't know how to pray. I don't know the right way to pray. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, this then is how you pray. Go ahead and go to that slide. This is Matthew 6. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is called the Lord's Prayer. How many, just in this room, because I can see you, how many of you have, have heard the Lord's Prayer before? You've read the Lord's Prayer before? You've said the Lord's Prayer before? If you're watching online, it, it, this isn't something that's unfamiliar to a largely churched crowd or region, right? But how many of you, this is what happens when we become so used to or so accustomed to seeing something, oftentimes it feels like it loses its power and its significance over time. You know what I'm talking about? I think some in this room may read that prayer or hear that prayer and they say, David, that doesn't do anything for me. That doesn't mean that the prayer is broken. What that means is we're broken. That'd be a great spot for an amen. Think about it. So often we approach scripture God said, this is alive, this is active, this is sharper than a double-edged sword. We approach it. Jesus says, this is how you pray. You want to understand prayer as a destination? You pray like this. This is how you pray. So often we do this, West Michigan. We read that? Yeah, it didn't work. Didn't work, God. What, you got a different one? Is there another prayer you want me to pray? Jesus said, this is how you pray. That's us. That's us. That means we've, we've cheapened it. Or we've dismissed it. Or we haven't allowed it to penetrate something deep within us. What Jesus said is, this is how you pray. Look at these. Our Father in heaven. Some of you need to sit with our Father. Some of you didn't have a, a Father in your life. Or some of you, the Father figure in your life was, was abusive. Or was absent. Or was gone. I mean, just all together, he was there but gone. Jesus says, our Father, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, the one who is above all and in all, who created everything, who, who the world is but a footstool, sits above everything, and he sits on the throne in heaven with angels all around him, singing over and over, day and night for all of eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's what they sing over and over and over and over. So there's the throne room, there's the angels, they're singing, they're worshiping, and what God says is, is I'm your daddy. I'm your father. I'll provide for you. I'll protect you. And yet so many of us, we go, I, I'd rather stay distant. I don't, I don't want to come to you as a father. God says, I am what every father should be. Hallowed be your name. As I was sitting in here even last night just meditating on this, hallowed be your name, I just started thinking God's name is above all names. It is different than all other names. It is holy, it is righteous, it is pure, it is elevated above everything else. The name Jesus, nothing supersedes it. It's like God's name is so holy and we cheapen it. We, we reduce it, we minimize it, we treat it like it's any other name. God says, no, no, no. I, I am different and above everything. Your kingdom come 
and your will be done. We hate that. In our country, we hate that. In our society, we hate, our prayers usually go like this, God, my kingdom come and my will be done, not yours. And so we get, we get frustrated, we get angry, we start turning sinful, we start using social media as a platform, we start driving because we say, this is my kingdom, this is about what I want, this is about what serves me, this is about me as the end goal, me as the benefactor, me, 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 my stuff is everything, right? And what God says is wrong, my kingdom come and my will be done. When we pray that and we ask God to change that in our hearts, we submit to him rather than asking him to submit to us. That will change you on a heart level. On earth as it is in heaven, give us today our daily bread. That's, God, give me what I need right now but not any more that I might become self-reliant. Give me what I need today. Feed me, fuel me, speak to me, allow me to be dependent on you and give me just enough so that I come tomorrow for the exact same thing. And then on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, and then on Friday and Saturday, and I just do it day in and day out. Feed me. God, I just picture my toddler coming up to me, Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm not going to give him a month's worth of food. I'm going to give him what he needs right now. So often we ask for retirement. So often we ask, God, remove the risk. God, give me so much that I, will, I, I won't have any need, and just in case you don't provide, I'll have extra. God says, that's a broken cistern. It will turn moldy. It'll, it'll be full of algae and bacteria. It'll become unhealthy for you. Come to me daily. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. When we sang the song Mercy just a few minutes ago, I put myself in the throne room of God. I know my sin, I know my shame, I know my guilt, I know what I carry, I know the burden, and every day I'm alive, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And I know one day I'm gonna be in the throne room and it's all gonna be right there and God's gonna look right at me and the only word I'm gonna say is mercy. Because it's crippling. When we have an understanding of who we are, it also shapes our understanding of who God is. When you realize how broken and sinful and dirty we all are, you realize how pure and holy and amazing he is. And then it becomes difficult because we like to hold things against other people. Whether it's anger, whether it's bitterness, whether it's resentment, whether it's grudges, whether it's judgment, whatever it is. When we pray this prayer, God says, as I have forgiven you, you must do that to each other because you're all my children. That'll change you on a soul level. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The temptation today, I'm gonna tell you, is to walk out of here and say that wasn't real. The temptation today is that God provided maybe for now, but he won't continue to provide for forever. The temptation is I don't want to be dependent on God for everything, so I'm gonna go create independence for myself. The temptation is gonna be to chase sin, to run after broken cisterns, to run to dry and empty wells, to keep trying to fill ourselves with entertainment or wealth, greed, lust. I mean, you name it. it there's so many things that it's like we keep running to that over promise and under deliver. And God says, he says right here, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God says, if you submit to me, if you pray this, I will lead you not to temptation, not to destruction, not to sickness, but, 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 but to me, I'll deliver you from the evil one. Because it's about his kingdom. 
because it's his power, not our power. It's his glory. And he says it'll be that way forever. So right now, I'm done preaching. Sermon's over. I just felt like God said when I was prepping, he was like, after this, you're done. So I'm done. Happy sermon for you. Uh, my desire, my prayer for you today is that you will walk out and not say, wow, in the sermon when he said blank, that really touched me. Or man, when we sang that song, that just moved me. I, my hope and my prayer for every single one of you in this room has been, I heard from God today. Some of you haven't heard from God in a long time. Some of you have never heard from God, but the invitation, the buffet has been set for you. And it's to come forward. So this, this is uncomfortable. This is the part that may get clunky. This is the part we don't know all what it's gonna look like or what it's gonna, what's gonna happen. But I'm, I'm gonna stay up here and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna invite you because I've sat in your seats. In fact, one of the most one of the most significant times in our marriage between Shannon and I was when we were sitting in seats just like these at an event where a speaker just like me got up and said, I wanna invite you to come forward in prayer. And I felt like God prompted me and said, you need to go up. And so I grabbed Shannon's hand and we walked up and we got on our knees and I was praying. I'm saying, okay, God, speak, speak. What is it? Why am I here? What is it? And I was spending so much time like, God, what is it? I feel like I'm not hearing anything. I'm not getting anything from you. And it was for Shan. Some of you need to be obedient today for the sake of the person you're sitting next to. To come forward. To just pray. Not as a means to get something, but as a destination. Some of you need to spread out. Some of you, we have this prayer room over here on the side. This is gonna be up the entire series. Whenever you need to go over there and just get a little bit more privacy, go do it but I wanna invite you right now into the throne of grace where you can release things back to God, where you can run to him as the spring of living water, just like this picture, where you can come up to him as the spring of living water rather than running to your own broken, dried out, disgusting cisterns. So right now, um, I'm gonna invite you to some of you, if you stand up, move forward, come right before, get on your knees, prostrate, spread to the sides, whatever you need to do, move to the prayer space over here. And, and we're gonna spend some time praying together and the worship team is gonna, is gonna continue to minister to us as well. So let's pray. God, we just come before you right now. And God, we repent for making prayer about us. We repent for making prayer this transition that we come to you and we use you as a means to our own end. God, we repent of that. We lay that down right now before you. God, the weight that so many of us are carrying is heavy. We don't wanna use you. We just wanna be with you. God, we thank you that you call us your children. 
And so we come to you right now, God. Some of us didn't have fathers in our lives. Some of us, our fathers were gone. Some of us, our fathers abandoned us. Some of us, fathers did more woundedness to our hearts than anybody else in this entire world. God, we come to you as our heavenly father, as our perfect father, as the model for who you, you have created us as fathers and mothers to be to our kids. God, we come to you as our father. Your children are hungry. And I just pray that you would feed us right now. God, holy is your name. We repent right now for the ways that we've cheapened you, for the way that we've made you and following you about us, for the way we've used it to our own gain, for the way that we, we, we take things that you do, take things that you've gifted us with, take things that you've blessed us with, and then we use them for ourselves, that we hoard or we keep them close or we lock them down, we get selfish, we get greedy, we make it about us. God, we repent of that right now. Your name is holy. Your name is righteous. Your name is pure. Your name is above all other names, including our own. Jesus, we just lift up our hands to you right now. We just say, holy is your name. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. We join the angels right now, God. It's just singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy God. stay in our apartment, whatever it is, God, we bring those physical needs to you and we ask that you would meet them. You know what we need. We're your children. And so we just lay those down before you. We just ask that you would meet our needs, that you would give us our daily bread. God, thank you for forgiving us. We carry so much sin, so much baggage, so much guilt. I just pray that we could release that right now, just opening up our hands back to you. We just release that to you. We release our guilt to you. We release our shame to you. Some of us in this room came carrying grudges today. Some of us have sown division among us. 
Some of us are angry. Some of us are resentful. Some of us are just wounded by the actions of another person. Some of us are crippled, God. And it's, it's crippled us because we can't let it go. You say you've forgiven us. Jesus on the cross as he hung there, he looked at us, he thought of us, he pictured us, and he said, it's for you that I'm here. I'm paying your price so that you can come directly to the Father. So God, I pray right now, I pray right now that you would give us the courage and the boldness to forgive those who have wronged us. As you've forgiven us our debt, we pray, God, that we would forgive those who are indebted to us. God, lead us not into temptation. Don't let us dismiss this time. Don't let us dismiss this moment. Don't let us dismiss your working. Don't let us cheapen it. Don't let us get in the car and never talk about it again or never acknowledge it or, or get weird at home as we're eating lunch or whatever. Don't let us forget. Don't let us just go back to our, the way our lives were and Sundays and whatever. Let us come back different people. God, let this church be known as a group of people who come thirsty for you to speak for you to move. Let this be a church known, not for what we do, but for how we pray. And deliver us from the evil one. Because it's all about your kingdom, God. For yours is the glory and the power forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and all God's people said together.